please put your hands together and welcome director Will Sharp, the fabulous Claire Foy and Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> welcome back. Thank you. Can I just in advance apologise for my shoes? <laughs> I have, I, I'm, so, I'm wearing slippers, I haven't worn high heel shoes for a really long time and they really hurt my feet, so I'm just really sorry about that. If you could just ignore what's happening here, that would be really great. There we go, I love that. You get a round of applause, we all know how you feel. It's a very um, American applause there. <laughs> it's another sign of COVID, isn't it? It's like, you know. Yes, so it is. maybe you have COVID. <laughs> um, congratulations on this film. Um, I just had a, a wonderful opportunity watching it and I felt so kind of, um, it was a real breath of fresh air to be honest, to, to go and experience something that felt really different as well at, at the cinema. Um, well, congratulations, really, really wonderful. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know how and when you kind of connected with, with Louis and his story and what it was that you connected with when you were first, this was kind of first presented to you or you first thought about making it. Uh, well, I think the first thing was probably his pictures. Um, I found it very sort of fascinating that on the surface of it, there were these silly, charming, anthropomorphized cat tableaus, but then occasionally there'd be an inscription or something that betrayed a kind of underlying anxiety, fragility of some kind. Um, and then that led me on to read more and more about his life, and I just found him to be an incredibly inspiring, extraordinary human being. And with regards to the story that you wanted to tell, was it quite easy, the journey that, that, that laid itself in front of you of, of how you would tell that story? I don't know if easy is the right <laughs> word. But, um, Clear? I, th I think the one thing that I knew was I really wanted this movie to feel like a life and to be able to experience Louis's life in some way with him and to be able to look back on certain parts of his life from when he was an older man. and. I guess that informed a lot of the choices, uh, and I guess the key thing for me was to try and to try to understand him first and foremost as a human being, mm -hmm. uh, and to try and share that whatever you know understanding we were able to get of him with an audience, uh, and to treat his life with great empathy. I guess so. That was like the rudder. So in that sense, it was easy, but it's a very sort of complicated life, I guess, in yeah. any way. Benedict, for you, did you, were you, did you know much about him prior to this project? No, prior to um, Ed and Guy Healy coming to me from Shoebox with a script for Adam and myself to take interest in as an actor and producing team, um, I didn't. And I, I had a vague inkling of recognition when I saw the um, images. Um, you know, I thought that, 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 that definitely on the periphery of my memory, my childhood, definitely I've seen those cat drawings before. But no, I knew nothing about him, nothing. So where did you start from that point then, to the point where you agreed to not just come on board as a producer, but, but to, to portray him, to you know, in, interpret him in your way? Uh, books, looking at the paintings. Uh, the Chris Beetle's got a fantastic book, Louis Wayne's Cats, and it's um, being reissued. Plug. <laughs> um, I wrote the forward, plug. Um, I did, it was terrifying. It's the most nerve wracking thing I've ever done in my life. I can speak, but I don't know about that. Um, anyway, it was it was a pleasure to revisit it. it it's, a, it's a great book for what Will's describing as every kind of detail you'd want to know. But really discovering him was mm. just getting him on his feet, just trying to um, sew together the little sort of clues that you look for when you're doing your research. So an account of his movement, an account of him having quite a sort of um, a tonal sort of monotonal delivery, whether he's talking about the world coming to an end or there's a very nice pair of shoes you're wearing, and there's a sort of neutrality to his delivery, um, which is a little bit more colourful at the beginning of the film, but certainly with other people in public, in front of the publisher, um, so Ingram, you know, all, all the, the heightened moments, he, he becomes a little bit more tight on purpose, um, his walk, the rigidity of that, but also where he is relaxed, where he becomes physically more uh, at ease with who he is, and psychologically, uh, most importantly, at ease with who he is in the company of his wife. Um, I were, well, we worked with a, I did some fun dancing with a dance instructor and, um, and thrashed around on a piano and talked to Will and rehearsed with the kids and the cats and the actors for a week. Uh, costume informed a lot. He was yeah. a bit of a dapper dresser. I think a lot of his um, money that wasn't squandered through not having IP control. And, and any kind of business acumen was, was put into what the Victorians thought was very important, which was this presentational side of things. 
Um, that informs a lot. Um, I'm trying to think, that feels like so long ago I did it. <laughs> but that, you know, yeah. it, you, you reach for things, but it's only once you start actually animating it and, and being him yeah. um, that, that things start to make sense. And this beautiful relationship that we, we see on, on screen, it's so, it's so fabulous to watch both of you, you know, bring this relationship to, to, to life. It really is. It's, a, it's got this kind of childlike naivety to it at moments. It's got this kind of just, you know, sort of finishing each other's sentences or, or the kind of almost kind of thinking each other's thoughts in a way. It's just wonderful. You see so much of this relationship, even when there are no words sometimes as well. Claire, for you in terms of finding her, I, I don't know, was there, was, is there much written about her? Is there much to know about her? Or where did you find Emily? Where did you kind of start with her? Um, I think my main um, approach was your script, really. Well, because there wasn't, there's nothing about her, but as there is about so few women. Um, and a she's actually ten years older. In in real life, she was ten years older um, than he was. Um, and I'm not ten years older than Meredith Combat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 am I ten years younger? You acted ten years younger. I acted ten years younger. Yeah. She's far more mature um, than wise. So, yeah. so I just played younger. really mature. Um, <laughs> no, but I think that that was the thing. I think that she, the thing I loved so much about it was she was this sort of pure, and I don't mean that in the sense of innocent. I mean pure in the sense that she saw the world in a very simple and accurate way, mm. and she was able to quiet his mind. Um, and it was a meeting of two people who suddenly had walked the planet not really knowing how it all worked and then they met each other and went, oh, you make sense and I don't really know why because you're quite strange but, <laughs> but, but that they just sort of met each other and that was it. Um, and they spoke a sort of different language and it, and it was so easy and lovely and that's why it's so tragic because they were given so, so little time. Um, and, and it was just so touching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was nothing... It's one of the few parts I've played where there was very little for me to do, apart from, you know, the one thing that just clinched it for me, really, was the, the speech where she says about there's so much beauty in the world. And it just, that was her, really. Mm. She just saw it. She saw everything. She saw him, basically, and allowed him to see who he really was, I think. You say you had very little to do, though, but you're, you're there through the entire film. You know, your presence is there and the, the effect that, you, that their relationship had on him is there through the entire film. So even though, you know, once she's passed, she's, you're still a part of this film. And that's, a lot of that's down to your performance, I think. Oh, I don't think of, it is, because I was barely there. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the lasting impression that you've made from that, but also on the relationship yeah, they that... Did that. They did that, because we had like a really lovely kind of, I don't know, four week thing where we made what I thought was the film and it was us in a little house and we had a lovely time and we played with cats and it was all beautiful and wonderful yeah. and then they went and did you know six weeks of really hard work and they did everything else <laughs> so that's got nothing to do I think that's just that's Will and it's Ben and it's the Take memory the compliment she means your re work resonates which it oh, does no, no, no. it does no, it does it, does, it is that, I think it's that, that that was what we set up that's what we did basically in those first few weeks we definitely yeah. carried those early weeks through the shoot I think yeah. and it was uh, not entirely by design, but it was really nice to have done all of that work because that's what Louis carries with him through his life. So I think we definitely, we sort of missed you, but also you were still around in a weird way. <laughs> Playing with the cats. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <there I> was. <laughs> in terms of the aesthetic of it as well, well, you've just this amazing artistic kind of wash of, of creativity that's across this film. It's, it's a really unconventional way of telling a film, but I love it. It's so exciting, it's so forward thinking and just different. I, I wanted to ask about how you came to the decisions about how you would tell the story visually and, and represent this man, this character, you know, how he's, how he's dealing with things mentally, I feel is, is partly how and why you chose that way. I don't know. If that's yeah, I, I guess, well, aesthetically speaking, I think, I wanted to be influenced as much as possible by Louis Wayne's own work and the world of Wayne. Uh, and so, you know, from the set design to the photography, the blocking, uh, all of that was trying to borrow, you know, often in quite specific ways from pictures that Louis Wayne had created. In terms of the sort of psychology of it, I guess, uh, I suppose, yeah, there was the challenge of trying to get under the skin of this 
you know, slightly unusual character with a very particular kind of brain. Um, and I felt like that was some things that, you know, we talked about from the very beginning in rehearsal, but it was also some things that I wanted to bring to life in some way visually. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's kind of sewn into its fabric as well, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess, well, aesthetically speaking, I think I wanted to be influenced as much as possible by Louis Wayne's own work and the world of Wayne. Uh, and so, you know, from the set design to the photography, the blocking, uh, all of that was trying to borrow, you know, often in quite specific ways from pictures that Louis Wayne had created. In terms of the sort of psychology of it, I guess, uh, I suppose, yeah, there was the challenge of trying to get under the skin of this, you know, slightly unusual character with a very particular kind of brain. Um, and I felt like that was some things that, you know, we talked about from the very beginning in rehearsal, but it was also some things that I wanted to bring to life in some way visually. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's kind of sewn into its fabric as well, I guess. Did that rehearsal period um, inform changes? You know, in terms of did you go into that rehearsal period with an idea of of what you wanted to do and through rehearsal and through seeing things develop, did it change much or? Uh, not really. I mean, like what I will say is that with both Benedict and with Claire and indeed with you together and your sort of chemistry, it felt immediately sort of apparent. And I think you both probably do this with every job you do, but it felt quite effortless in a way um, and I've told this story a couple of times yeah, we're we friends, know each other a lot <laughs> <laughs> there's a shorthand which, does, yeah. which counts for a lot yeah. but I, th I suppose the one thing it did maybe change was um, maybe the way of like shooting you two together uh, because I think when we were rehearsing I felt like it was I had such confidence in you both and it felt so sort of real and palpable that often I would sort of decide that I just wanted to hold them in the same frame and not really get in the way as much as possible. So in that sense, it probably did inform some of the camera choices at least, yeah. Um, another thing I love is the fact that you didn't feel the need to diagnose him in the film. You know, you didn't need to give him a, con a condition. It was, more, it was about his existence and his journey and his reaction to everything that life threw at him and man he was so resilient you know everything that it threw at him um, was that deliberate and why did you want to do that because the easy option would have been to you know to, to do that well he was di in his lifetime he was diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, and that's since been sort of contested and there are various theories about maybe it was a kind of Asperger's maybe it was bipolar um, and I think I, we all sort of felt like we didn't really want to fall into the trap of trying to retro, sort of posthumously diagnose him with something. So with all of this, I think we were just trying to look at the evidence that we had in front of us and then just present it to you guys, uh, sort of as cleanly as we could and not to make any judgment on it particularly. And so, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't want it to become a sort of but a, a film of medical interest, but more just trying to understand him again, I guess, as a person. If, if that makes sense. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's the beauty of kind of how different people who are seen as being different and what they can find within themselves to to make the world a better place, really. And I think that that's one of the lovely film things that comes out of this film. Um, the, the, the rest of the cast as well, what a cast. It's so great. And I love that it feels like that every one of them has a moment, has their moment, is allowed to have a time to have their moment. And Andrea's incredible in this. Um, Hayley Squires, I just think, I mean, I could go through them all, Sharon Rooney, they're all brilliant. Was that really important to you? Because, you know, it's not just a case of being in the background, and yes, they are in the background quite a lot, but they all get a moment to kind of come forward and, and really shine. And... I definitely really wanted there to be a strong sense of the family dynamic, because that felt like a big part of Louis' story, was that he was the only man in this household full of women mm. uh, and you know as it explains in the film that made him sort of by default the sort of breadwinner but he's kind of the least qualified <laughs> to actually do that uh, and I felt like there was you know comedy and tragedy to be mined from that so in the rehearsal period we did spend some time trying to create that family chemistry I guess and there were some scenes where there was very little script and I knew that I'd want to be able to just allow them to eat together or pack together or whatever it was and so 
certainly the family dynamic was really important, but yeah, no, I just, I mean, I just felt really lucky and weirded out by working with so many amazing people. <laughs> <laughs> it's the tone of the film as well that's so clever because it's, it's really funny in, in places and then it's, it's tender, it's heartbreaking, it's, it's all these different things and I, I, in terms of the, the writing of it, um, what you wanted and set out to try and achieve with the tone of the film, did you set out to, to make something specific with that or was that just through exploring him and his experience that you came to that? I don't know, I think that's just how it comes out. I, 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 it's not it's on purpose. Genius. It's not, <laughs> it's not <laughs> on purpose. But I, I guess I find life often very funny and often unbelievably difficult. And so I can't, that's just how I see the world, I guess. So that's the only way I can present it, I guess. That's, I love that way that comedy can is almost a great tool to get through so many situations as well. And I also felt like, you know, with working with both of you, that, you know, I knew that there would be scenes that needed to be comedic and scenes that needed to hit home dramatically. And I've told this story a couple of times, so I hope I've remembered it correctly. But I think the first time I spoke to you about the film, you were in Ikea <laughs> and over the phone. Oh, no, I, yeah, I yeah, was. Yeah, OK, because I've said it a couple of times, and I'm like, shit, what if she wasn't in Ikea? Um, I really wasn't in Ikea. Not together, that's why. It's in the bowels of it yeah. as well, where you're at the end and you're yeah. picking your stuff yeah. up. So it wasn't even in the, the meatballs. The meatballs were just there waiting. Um, yeah, yeah, the meatballs bit, basically. Yeah. And I remember, like, you know, thinking a bit about the character of Emily in the script at the time and the, how to make something of her flaws. And uh, I... I just remember talking to you on the phone, not having met you in real life, and thinking, well, it feels like I'm speaking with Emily, and Emily is in the you in were in a weird, You were in a weird place, though, as well, weren't you? You were in a weird place with loads of birds or something? I was in a castle. I was wrecking a castle, and they lent me the kitchen because it had the best reception, and the kitchen was full of canaries. Yeah! yeah. Would it have been weird if it had been cats? Yeah. <laughs> Canaries, especially. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Terrified canaries. Um, just two quick questions before we come to the audience. So I'm just giving you a quick warning. Um, Benedict, with this role in terms of you know an actor looking at, at what lays ahead of you and what the opportunities it gives you as an actor to to play a character, this is you know it feels like we see more than one version of this this man in terms of what he's going through, uh, and that also includes over decades. And I just thought it was beautiful this very subtle differences that we see in him physically and 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 even if you know how he holds himself or or even how much he projects or how he speaks is that something that was you, you collaborated on and worked on as to what at certain times he needed to be as a person uh, yeah it's definitely um i mean you know like claire said it's all sort of the, the real homework the psychological homework is apparent in, in will's script and the stepping stones that it offers you um but yes, uh, I did work at um, Aging specifically. Um, I first, I think, watched this, well, one of the roughest, latest cuts, at least complete cuts, with my uh, dad in New Zealand, where we were all locked down when I was filming Power of the Dog, and they'd come over for like a two week visit and ended up staying five months. Wow. So I'm next to an 83 year old severe asthmatic who I'd held close um, for a long time, who uh, couldn't speak at the end of the film, and I realized, oh shit, yes, I've, I've put a lot of you into this film. <laughs> and the double whammy for a father watching his son age, which is something he'll never get to experience, as well as the emotional impact of the story. I mean, a poor man, I should have warned him about the triggers in the film before I sat down to watch it. But, um, you know, yes, yeah, so he, he, he formed a massive cornerstone without me fully realising it um, until, until that point. Um, and yes, we worked with... Um, I didn't really work movement on that. I did my own movement with Will and just tried things out. And uh, we had a fantastic prosthetics team as well, um, led by my makeup designer, uh, Donald McInnes. Um, because he, even if it wasn't just the aging, he went through a huge sort of stylistic shift every other scene. He's sporting a different tash or hairdo. So um, just aesthetically, there was that. But that was a consideration. You know, it's, it's, it's a, when you're telling a life, um, the biggest cheat for me was being younger uh, than Claire Foy, but um, that, that's fine. Um, he is older than I am. I am a lot older. Than <laughs> than <laughs> than Just to reiterate that, by a substantial should, amount. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I, 
I'm, I'm proud of it. It's hard. It's about two years, long, isn't it? Long, long, long. <laughs> long. Um, anyway, yeah, that was that was the biggest bit of acting, uh, as Claire's just pointed out in a rather brutal way. Um, but aging was easy, um, and I didn't. I, I, I just, yeah, it, it is when you look at a script like that, you go, great. This is so integral to actually carrying the story home. It can't become a young actor in struggling out the prosthetics. And something I really learned on this um, through Christian, uh, who did them with Donald is to really inhabit it, to puppet them, to not be afraid of moving yourself inside of them and just treat them as this layer of skin that does have mobility. And But I'm talking about it very technically. I, it, psychologically, it's sort of, um, yeah, it's just, it, you are still the young person inside the old body. And that I very much experienced with my father. Um, and it's that, it's trying to feel that. And that, therefore, you know, the dance, one of those things I enjoyed doing most was him as an old man dancing a sort of reference to his crazed dance technique um, early on when he's falling in love with Emily. Um, but yes. It's very um, comforting watching you as an old man, looking forward to your career in years to come. <laughs> yeah. I love old Benedict, you look great. Old Benedict's great, can't wait for old Benedict. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, decades. Um, let's get some questions from our audience. Thank you. Um, so I think Eric Wilson, the DP, and I decided to favour the ac academy ratio because it felt kind of fairy tale, a little bit nostalgic, and suited some of the Louis Wayne esque group blocking sort of portraiture that we wanted to go for. I also think that it's great for close ups. Uh, and, you know, for instance, that, you know, one of my favourite scenes where it's you two together just before Emily's taken away from us. For scenes like that, I think it works really well, where there's very little negative space and your entire attention is just on the performance and on that characters in front of you. In terms of the second question, I think that's just a legal disclaimer <laughs> that, is, that is at the end of almost every true based on a true story. <laughs> Make something up, Willis. Oh my God. But, there, but I mean, like, so William Ingram was a real person, Emily was a real person, all the sisters were real people. Um, H.G. Wells really was a part of Louis Wayne's story. He really was found in a psychiatric hospital. I think one of the parts of the development of the script was, I think the more we veered away from the truth, in a funny way, the, more, the less remarkable it felt. The more it started to feel like it was just a sort of movie for a movie's sake. Uh, and we were sort of exploiting a life to the ends of making a movie, whereas I think we were all keen to use the platform of a movie to benefit the life of Louis Wayne, in honour of the life, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The score, I've got to mention the music because the music it's is really good. It's so great and it's so many things as well. It's great. I love it's a theremin. Yeah. Um it's so it's so emotive. It's beautiful. Um, but there's lots of other beautiful sweets in there as well. We'll need to talk a little bit about that and and, and is it your brother? Yeah, he's here actually. Hi Arthur. <laughs> Amazing uh, work. <laughs> We work very closely together on on all my projects, and mm -hmm. I think there's this theme of electricity. It's probably the sort of most tangible storytelling use of the score, uh, where Louis at different times feels like there's something in the air, and he's. I felt like he was someone who's very hungry to understand the way the world works, like what it runs on, and so I think Arthur was. I don't want to speak for you, but like, was keen to sort of find electronic sounding instruments that also felt vintage and uh, nostalgic in a funny way. And so there's some musical saw and theremin, they came to represent the sound of electricity and to carry the electricity theme uh, as it were. Uh, but alongside that, I mean, I remember early on, I sent Arthur a link to some music for cats, <laughs> which in a funny way had some of these sort of theremin-esque, mm -hmm. sort of almost meowish uh, sounds in it. So. I don't know if that made its way into the score or not, but that's just like a anecdotal tidbit, I guess. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I made a decision early on that I didn't want to use CG because I thought it would turn this into a different kind of movie. Um, for better and for worse. And uh, I think I'm really happy with how the cat's, the cat's presence in the movie, but it certainly meant that we had to be 
quite patient at times on set. Uh, there was a sort of cat mode. I'll, I'll unleash you on this, Benedict. Yeah. A second. <laughs> like, hold on, nice. hold on, hold on. There's, we had to go into a sort of cat mode when no sudden movements, no loud noises, be very respectful of the cat and not to panic them. Uh, and, you know, and I just had to be, I just had to understand that they're very independent minded creatures. So sometimes they would do what we needed them to do, and other times they would not. Like so fucking actors, but we didn't get that treatment. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I was haunted by the sound of the clicker, which is the only, you can only go one way with a cat. You don't punish them. I mean, maybe in the olden days, certainly not now. <laughs> certainly, hopefully never. But you click to bloviantly trigger a cat into believing it will get a reward for doing the bidding that you're asking it to do. It, it, it is a night. I literally, it is a nightmare. You go home and you just start hearing the <laughs> you sleep at night. It might work for actors. You were joking at one point finding a big clicker for me. Benedict, size clicker. But yeah. it, 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 they are the golden moments are golden, and, and kittens are kittens. They are extraordinary. They do exactly what they say on the tin. They they play with balls of string and make you know sources of milk. They're great. The minute you get slightly old on the kitten, fucking forget it. Your, your, filming, your schedule goes out the window. It literally takes you a day to get the cat to move from one side of the room to other to sort of look vaguely interested at you or a flashing light bulb or a bit of bacon or whatever. It's just terrible. We had to learn to be very specific because they need specific instructions if they're trained cat actors. So if I ever asked... Can we just have a couple of cats in the room, please? It would be like, well, what do you want them to do? It's like, oh, it doesn't really matter, just put a couple of cats in the room. You know, they live with cats, but where do you want them to be? When? So every scene would need to be broken down. So it's like, well, what if they start next to that sofa, and then they go over there, and then the army of cat wranglers would arrange themselves with various treats, and the cat would be leaving at a very specific time to go over there. So it wasn't exactly what I expected. <laughs> I have to say, I, do, I, I wouldn't want to work with them again, but I do love them. I'd like to have them in my life, but not, not as a, as a co-star. It's quite a giveaway that every time you say the word cat, your voice breaks well. It's kind of like yeah. the absolute kind of terror of the memories of cat. <laughs> I also felt, because I have two cats at home, I sometimes felt like they were quite suspicious of me when I could, like, who have you been hanging out I can with? smell the other <laughs> Oh, I believe that the couple of them ended up with your producer as well, with Adam, so, you know, that's... Yeah, the one upside you think to working with cute cats, you get to take one home. My best friend took both of them. <laughs> Unbelievable. No, yeah, so I do, I get to see Norbs and poor, the, the slightly different cat that was the, well, very similar cat to Norbs, it was Norbs' standard, was called not Norbs. He, he's had an upgrade since then. What's he called, Adam? Nero. Nero, there you go. So, yeah, he's still a Not Norbs, though. Not, not Norbs, yeah. I love the fact that the cat had a stand in as well. That's I know. Amazing. Again, I didn't have a fucking stand in, but the fucking cat had a stand in. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the, the idea that, because of what I, I think is brilliant, you celebrate him as a person. You celebrate the man. You know, with, with, with everything that he goes through, with, you know, with his, his highs and his lows and his, his wonderful array of hairstyles and costumes and, and, and cats and drawings and ages. Um, was that what you set out to do, to celebrate this life? Yeah. In short, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, honestly, we did. And yeah. we all fell in love with him yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's it... I get some extraordinary uh, chances in my life uh, at the moment, and um, I, I relish all of them, but it's, it, there are only a handful that, that really get under your skin that you really lean into understanding and loving, and he was one of them. He really was. Um, yeah, I think we all care very deeply about him. Yeah, we all, I, I felt, in a, I've definitely felt like there were days where we felt like Louis Wayne was sort of around in some way, and the art department in particular. I remember early on when they were painting the mirror uh, for the scene, and uh, and they were just like, "This is really weird." I just sort of feel like I'm channeling. <laughs> it's really bizarre. Yeah, there's an odd thing you do when you practice the signature of a character, especially if it's a real life character, where you think, "Christ, this is actually sort of the hand-eye coordination." You know, there is some kind of physical connection to a moment that you know has happened. Um, I was painting all the time on the side, drawing all the side, and, and on set and on the actual sets as well as the props and just keeping my hand in. I did a lot of school, but I didn't even prep that side of him. I, I kind of do that anyway, but I hadn't for a while. And this was just a lovely re-exploration of that. And in doing that, in enacting that, 
especially in it just yeah it does feel like you're 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 playing close to someone mm -hmm. when that happens you've done a wonderful job i think it's also such a healthy uh, telling of someone with mental health issues in, in a in a really beautiful and celebratory way um yeah it's beautiful thank you so much thank you for your question thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.